The United States sent today to the United Nations Security Council a resolution that was designed to have an immediate ceasefire in the Israel Hamas war and to uh, try and get hostages back. That's what we had attempted to do. President Biden had been talking for some time that he's been trying to negotiate behind the scenes along with a number of other countries to get the hostages released and to have a ceasefire that goes along with that. Today, the United Nations or the United States uh, submitted this resolution to the UNSC for a vote, and it was vetoed by both China and Russia, uh, which really kind of put a sour taste on things because the United States apparently had tried to, you know, run this through everybody so that they had a pretty good expectation that it would be passed first. Uh, and it didn't quite work out that way. Now, today we're going to have somebody because we're going to talk a lot of things about the, the whole Israeli Hamas war, uh, what's going on with the potential invasion into Rafah, uh, with the, the Palestinians themselves who are now nearing the point of physical starvation. And we have nobody better than somebody who's been on the ground there before and has been on this show. Welcome back, Professor uh, Omar Bartov from Brown University, a former IDF soldier. Uh, and just somebody who's really tied in with what's going on there. Professor, welcome back to the show. Thanks very much. Well, listen, we got a lot of things to discuss about here. And we'll, we'll just talk, start off with this UNSC uh, issue because uh, there's a lot of confusion about what really was going on there. And did we know it was going to be vetoed and we plan to do it anyway to try to highlight some things? Were we shocked about that? I think those are going to come out in the near term. But here you see uh, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, trying to put uh, a good face on her, trying to put a little lipstick on a pig, so to speak. Here's what he said after the veto. I think we were trying to show the international community's sense of urgency about getting a ceasefire tied to the release of hostages, something that everyone, uh, including the countries that vetoed the resolution, should have been able to get behind. Um, the resolution, of course, also condemned Hamas. It's unimaginable why uh, countries wouldn't uh, be able to do that. Uh, but I think the fact that we got uh, such a strong vote despite the veto uh, by two of the permanent members of the Security Council, again, is, is evidence and demonstration of the um, commitment, the conviction of countries around the world, and notably on the Security Council, uh, to see about getting the ceasefire, uh, getting the release of hostages now. That's what the resolution said. That's what it called for. And I think there, it, it showed that a strong commitment to that from many, many countries. Now, look, I, just right off the bat, I'll just say it's kind of an embarrassing argument to make that, you know, well, we got a lot of votes for this because then that would mean that the previous votes that the U.S. vetoed, which had overwhelming global support behind many of these things that we vetoed, then that would have been a powerful message and against us. And either way, uh, we don't come out looking very good. But I just wonder, what is your expectation? What did you think going when you heard this uh, this uh, UNSC resolution that was going forward? What did you think about it before? And were you surprised at the outcome? Um, well, you know, I was surprised because uh, it would have been better to pass this resolution for sure. Uh, but everybody has a, a bad taste in their mouth. I mean, the U.S. vetoed the, the previous three resolutions, and this time it offered one, and it was vetoed by Russia and China. So I'm I'm not interested really in trying to defend the Russian and Chinese position. They they should have voted in favor. Um, but let's face it, I mean, the United States can get Israel to change its policy um, by other means. It doesn't have to do it through the Security Council. It would be nice through that too, but it can simply do it by uh, putting pressure on Israel primarily through the vast amount of munitions that it's supplying Israel with. And so there's there's a lot going on the, behind the scenes. We don't know exactly what is going on. Today, Secretary Blinken was speaking in Israel, and after he spoke with Netanyahu, Netanyahu said that Israel will go to Rafah whether the U.S. agrees with it or not. But if he goes to Rafah, it has to do it with the American munitions. He cannot do it without them. So there is a kind of, you know, American policy has been all over the place on this. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we, we have, I, I think, part of the very uh, conversation you're talking about here. Uh, here was Netanyahu saying that not going after Hamas uh, in, in Rafah, well, he says, just doesn't make any sense at all. When people tell us don't go into Rafah, 
That's like telling the Allies, uh, listen, don't go into Berlin, leave, leave a quarter of the Nazi army intact. You know, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, if we leave a quarter of the uh, Hamas uh, uh, fighting uh, uh, terrorist uh, battalions in place, they'll regroup, reconquer Gaza, and, uh, in fact, perpetrate once again what they vowed to do, which is to repeat the October 7th massacre over and over and over again. Now, just on that on that point alone, before I get into a couple of related uh, clips there as well, what do you make of that argument that if we don't go into Rafa as much as we've done already, basically it's just going to be light in the fuse and they're going to come back again and, again and attack us again on a, more October 7th in the future? What do you make of that argument? Well, look, I mean, the IDF said that it was going into Gaza uh, to destroy Hamas it's a political and military leadership and to release the hostages. It's been fighting them for five months and it hasn't managed to do that. Uh, so first of all, this threat that they will go into Rafa and finish the job, they, it took them five months to get to where they are and they've not done too well, I have to say. Uh, I'm not sure that the IDF is ready to go in. From what I'm hearing, they actually would be happy to have a pause right now and to reorganize. If they want to go in, they actually have to call up reserves and move forces from, from, the, from the Lebanese border. So oh. it, a lot of this is empty talk. A lot of this is Netanyahu uh, trying to show that he is standing up to American politicians so as to save his own back uh, on the domestic scene in Israel, where he's highly unpopular, and he's using um, I would say, American fumbling of policy to his own advantage to try and secure his position in domestic Israeli policies. And this has nothing to do with actually waging an efficient campaign, which has not been waged against Hamas. Uh, let me ask you real quick on that point there. So Netanyahu is, is for the last <clears throat> week or 10 days, uh, continues to use this phrase that they have destroyed most of Hamas, but there's still four battalions of Hamas. When you're talking about Hamas who doesn't wear uniforms, uh, how do you even measure that there are battalions and and how would you how do you calculate when you've destroyed them? I mean, just on the practical level, how does Netanyahu add that or does he even say? I, I, I think a lot of this is uh, just rhetoric because by now we know that Hamas has actually gone back to northern Gaza. The areas of Gaza that were cleaned up, so to speak, uh, through vast destruction by the IDF. The, the IDF has been encountering Hamas fighters there. So yes, they have killed large numbers of Hamas militants. I, they, they cite numbers. I don't know whether these numbers can be believed or not. Uh, but after such a long time of fighting by a modern army against what was estimated to be 40,000 lightly armed, at, at the most, 40,000 lightly armed Hamas militants, uh, they may have destroyed a quarter of half of them. Uh, this counting um, on the Israeli media, you hear a lot, they've killed battalion commanders, they've killed brigade commanders, they are sort of applying uh, regular army uh, categories to a, to a militant organization that doesn't work that way. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, what exactly, and I'm, I'm not sure that they know, how much exactly they've degraded Hamas, but I would say that they don't appear to be ready to go into Rafa, quite apart from the fact that you have well over a million people there, and going into Rafa right now would be an absolute catastrophe. Well, yeah, and, and just, just fundamentally, how would they even yeah. distinguish between the male population <clears throat> of that million people and the Hamas fighters? How would you know who to kill? I mean, just being blunt about it. Um, I don't think they know. And from everything that I hear, they have been arresting a lot of uh, men of military age, whether they are members of Hamas or not, uh, jailing them. There have been many re reports of maltreatment of people, of torture. Uh, so they are just going against anybody who might be a militant. Uh, they, they, it does appear to me that their intelligence is particularly good. Uh, and the result of that is that these are not effective operations. By and large, the IDF for the last at least month is bogged down. 
It's not really conducting an effective military operation. It's not getting orders from the military, from the political leadership, what to do and where to go. And it's just biding its time. Well, that's certainly not a good situation for the uh, the people to be in there for, for many reasons. We're going to touch on that in just a second. But you said something a second ago. I want to go down the path here. Uh, and you said it seems like that, that Netanyahu is basically using indecisiveness on the Americans' part for his domestic audience back home. And we got a couple of pretty unpleasant examples of that. Uh, you had, during the State of the Union address, the President of the United States emphatically said, we want a two-state solution. Here's what he said. As we look to the future, the only real solution to the situation is a two-state solution over time. <laughs> And I say this, as a lifelong supporter of Israel, my entire career, no one has a stronger record with Israel than I do. I challenge any of you here. I'm the only American president of Israel in wartime. But there is no other path that guarantees Israel's security and democracy. So that, that was just the latest of many times the United States at senior official level and the president have emphatically said two-state solution has to be the ultimate. That's what he keeps saying. But then I think it was on Monday. We'll see here. Here's the latest of Netanyahu's repeated statements against that. Parliament members voted against the attempt to impose on Israel uh, a, hmm. a, a Palestinian state. You, see, you have to say when people say, oh, well, you know, this is Netanyahu and his fringe uh, you know, in fringe elements in his coalition? No, it's not. It's the vast majority of the Israeli public that understands that a Palestinian state, the way that is being envisioned, would be an enormous danger to Israel's future. So that's why they're united in resisting this. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm, I'm proud to lead this policy. So now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the numbers actually back him up on that, that a majority of the Israeli citizens actually do uh, support his position not to have a two-state solution, quote, rammed down his throat, as he said a couple of times since that State of the Union address. So that puts Netanyahu and Biden on opposite poles, moving in opposite directions. And then the question is, what happens in the middle? Well, look, I mean, Netanyahu has spent his entire career trying to kill uh, the two-state solution or any kind of resolution uh, of the conflict with the Palestinians. And because his policies have been so uh, rejectionist of any kind of uh, resolution, uh, the, the result has been that the extremists on both sides have grown more and more uh, powerful. And the, the public in the middle uh, is sort of caught between uh, the two sides. Um, it, he obviously does not want to see that kind of resolution. What is interesting is that Netanyahu himself is probably the least popular person in Israel today. And he's trying to use um, what he presents to the Israeli public as American pressure so as to strengthen his position in Israel as the only one who's defending Israel from its um, ally, the United States. Um, I don't think it's going to help him in the long run, but I'm sure that it's uh, going against the national interest of Israel itself because what was shown on October 7th is that Israel must bring some kind of political resolution to the conflict with the Palestinians, that it cannot be resolved by force. And Netanyahu tried to ignore it, tried to bury it, tried to support Hamas so that uh, he could say that there is no one uh, to talk with because Hamas is so extremist, yeah. and, and, and now has tried to destroy it. And what has happened is that Israel has become weaker in the process, not stronger, and it's becoming increasingly weaker vis-a-vis -vis also its greatest supporters. There's more and more people around the world among its supporters, just like President Biden, who's really had enough with that. And no. the, the only way to resolve this is to uh, change this government in Israel. It obviously cannot be done from Washington. Hopefully, it will be done by the Israeli electorate. And, and you know, you, you have to take a look at the, some of the others who are saying some of the similar kind of things. And you don't have to look any further than Jordan, which should be a, actually is a, has been a longtime friend of the United States and has been in relatively good relations with Israel. 
already pushing in the opposite direction. And, and King uh, Abdullah is warning this. We cannot afford an Israeli attack on Rafah. It is certain to produce another humanitarian catastrophe. The situation is already unbearable for over a million people who have been pushed into Rafah since the war started. We cannot stand by and let this continue. We need a lasting ceasefire now. This war must end. And also, this just this past Monday, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan seemed to echo that concern when he said this. Our position is that Hamas should not be allowed a safe haven in Rafah or anywhere else. But a major ground operation there would be a mistake. It would lead to more innocent civilian deaths, worsen the already dire humanitarian crisis, deepen the anarchy in Gaza, and further isolate Israel internationally. More importantly, the key goals Israel wants to achieve in Rafah can be done by other means. On the call today, President Biden asked the Prime Minister to send a senior interagency team composed of military, intelligence, and humanitarian officials to Washington in the coming days to hear U.S. concerns about Israel's current Rafah planning and to lay out an alternative approach that would target key Hamas elements in Rafah and secure the Egypt-Gaza border without a major ground invasion. The Prime Minister agreed that he would send a team. Obviously, he has his own point of view on a Rafa operation, but he agreed that he would send a team to Washington to have this discussion and have this engagement. So now, in my view, that's setting us up for something really bad here in the United States, because here you have the National Security Advisor, after the president has just said what he did in the State of the Union, saying that we think there is a better way to do it. We asked him to please, please, please send somebody to come talk to us. And so they did. But then you're not going to be surprised at all. Two days later, here was Netanyahu's response. Citizens of Israel, a short update on my last conversation with U.S. President Joe Biden. At the very beginning, we agreed that Hamas should be eliminated. But during the war, it's no secret, we had differences of opinion about the best way to achieve this goal. In the beginning, I told the president, Hamas cannot be defeated without the IDF entering the Gaza Strip. In our last conversation, I told him, it is impossible to complete the victory without the IDF entering Rafah, and this in order to eliminate the rest of the Hamas battalions. We will do the same this time. I want you to know that I have already approved the IDF's operational plan, and soon we will also approve the plan to evacuate the civilian population from the battle zones. Soon, soon we'll have a plan to evacuate the people. I don't know where he would evacuate them to because uh, a few days ago, I think the, the Israeli, one of the Israeli leaders was saying that they're going to continue simultaneously hitting in the northern, in the Gaza city area and in uh, Khan Yunus and several of these other places simultaneously with this. So I don't know where safe is even going to exist. Uh, but what do you think is going to happen when Netanyahu very clearly is going to completely ignore anything that the White House says, and he will definitely do whatever he wants. But when he goes into Rafa, and it now appears very certain it's a win, not if, and and he's not able to, quote, destroy the, the Hamas battalions because it, that won't destroy the, the resistance because I don't even, like we said a second ago, how do you even count who's who's Hamas and who's not? Uh, and, and the anger that's going to be left at the end of that operation among those who were survivors uh, is just going to be off the charts. So where is the possibility for peace? Where? How will Netanyahu, maybe a better question, how will Netanyahu present whatever happens after Rafa as a success to his supporters? Well, let me cut to the chase. I mean, Netanyahu uh, has no interest in this war ending, which is why he's saying there has to be a, an absolute victory. And it's a war in which there cannot be an absolute victory because it's a war that can end only by political means. And he is against those political means, but he has to stay in power because if he doesn't stay in power, he's in danger of going to jail. And so he has no interest in ending the war. When he says he wants to go to Rafa, he knows that he can't finish the war even if he does go to Rafa, which I, again, I'm, I don't see exactly how he can do it. So the only way to influence uh, Netanyahu is to say, if you want to go to Rafa, fine, but you're not getting any munitions from us. And the IDF can then operate for a week or two weeks or three weeks, and he'll run out of munitions. Uh, and then he'll have to face the music 
and say, look, I mean, I alienated our ally. We cannot continue the war because of my policies. Uh, that's the only way. As long as the Americans on the one hand are saying, uh, we have a different idea. We would like you to use political means, but they keep supplying him with arms, then he will continue. He is, he is basically biding his time for the elections. He is calculating that after June, there won't be any more pressure from the United States because the United States will be too, the administration will be too deeply engaged in politics. Then maybe uh, President Trump will return and then we'll see what happens. And he is one of those leaders. There are a number of them in the world who think if I can stay in power another month, another two months, that's fine. It doesn't matter to me how many people will die in the process. It doesn't matter what I do to the international relations of Israel, which are you know, basically going down the tubes, because I can stay in power. And I think that he believes someplace uh, in his mind that he's doing the right thing for Israel. He's not only about power. He's also an ideologue. But obviously, for any clear-minded person, what he's doing, he is weakening Israel by the day. And all those who are friends of Israel should work to remove that government through diplomatic, political means, uh, the most uh, powerful impact on Israeli policies is the United States. And the administration yeah. has just not been putting its foot down. Yeah. And, and, and look, I think that it's starting to become manifestly evident that there are bigger and bigger risks beyond whether Netanyahu stays or doesn't stay. Uh, they had this headline. I think this was earlier today. Gary, if you could throw that up there, uh, talking about some of the other regional risks where it says a war on Gaza. Israel is dragging the U.S. into a future regional war. And, and David Hurst goes on to write uh, that today Israel's invasion of Gaza is uniting the Arab world against Israel. The Houthis are now the toast of Arabs all over the Middle East for their campaign against the Western shipping in the Red Sea. A dangerous and potent mixture is brewing in Arab hearts all over the world. Anger, deep humiliation, and guilt. This is a recipe for an existential war, the likes of which this generation of Israelis has never experienced and has no appetite for. Do you think that he's exaggerating there, or do you think that this really is laying the seeds, even however this is resolved in the near term, that it could be laying the, the seeds for a future uh, insecurity for Israel in the region? I've been saying that, you know, I wrote about that uh, at least two months ago. The main danger is that the entire region now uh, will get engaged in this conflict and it will uh, veer entirely out of control. And that the United States would no longer be able to control it. And that would be, of course, bad for American policy. Uh, the United States has wanted, you know, for a long time now to focus on the Far East and it's stuck either in Ukraine or in the Middle East. But it will also be really bad for Israel. Uh, Israel now is weakening, not becoming stronger. Uh, the, the, we know that if Israel were to uh, uh, go into Lebanon, which uh, all kind of Israeli generals are threatening to do, it would get bogged down there too. And it is not a very large country. Uh, it's a country whose resources now are being run down. Uh, and so both for Israel, for the region, and for American policy, the most important thing to do right now is to put an end to this war and to create a situation whereby, obviously, the result would be that Netanyahu would have to finally go into elections, which he would lose. And to have a more rational, it won't be a particularly liberal government in Israel, even if it's removed, but it'll be a rational government that is not worried about keeping the war going on because that's the only way to stay out of jail. <laughs> and 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 you know one one of the near term uh, <clears throat> risks I think that, that certainly the, the already the biggest bill payer is the Palestinian people. Now that seems to be that is not seems to be it is pressing a lot of people even in the United States among Biden supporters for saying how can this continue going on? And you've probably seen the results of the the presidential uh, election for the Democrats in, in Michigan and Minnesota, where large numbers had protest votes to make their voices heard that they're not satisfied with this. And of course, in a general election, that would be political suicide for Biden, and he, and he will have to do something. So it looks like that that's starting to uh, change his policy. So we had uh, Secretary of State Blinken make this pretty stark statement a few days back. According to the most respected measure of these things, 100% of the population in Gaza is at severe levels of acute food insecurity. 
that's the first time an entire population has been so classified. Um, we also see, again, uh, according to, in this case, the United Nations, 100%, the totality of the population is in need of humanitarian assistance. So that's what is kind of generally taken to, to be the case. But then interestingly today, a couple of hours ago, uh, in the UNSC, in the United Nations Security Council meeting where the uh, the Russians and Chinese vetoed that, the Israeli ambassador had a very different take on that situation. The libelous narrative of famine in Gaza. This too is Hamas propaganda, which the UN has chosen to embrace. There is absolutely no limit, no limit that Israel places on humanitarian aid entering Gaza. And to date, 300,041 tons of aid on over 18,283 trucks have entered the Strip. Any country that wishes to provide more aid is more than welcome, and we will facilitate its entry. The only reason why any Gazan lacks aid is because Hamas loots it and steals much of it for themselves. So it's it's not because they didn't get in there and there. It's only Hamas that's causing the people to be starvation. But then that seems to be that puts it contrast and odds this claim that, number one, there are literally thousands of trucks like this of aid just parked, ready to go in, but are not yeah. being able to get in. And then why in the world? And I want to go down this path in a little bit more in detail here in a second. Is the United States building a military pier in the water to get food in when all they have to do is open the gates right now? And this all these trucks could then go in at, right now. So what the ambassador said doesn't seem to line up with reality. Well, look, first of all, we know that it's nonsense what he's saying. Um, there, there is severe shortage of clean drinking water, severe shortage of food uh, in Gaza. There are many, many reports of that. It's even reported. Uh, on, on the Israeli media, which has been generally behind the government. Uh, so we know all of that. Uh, it is bizarre that the United States, which is Israel's biggest ally, which is supplying it with munitions, has to go behind its back and to drop uh, supplies from the air and to open um, uh, a route for, for uh, sea transport into Gaza instead of telling Israel, you have to allow those trucks in and israel is not allowing the trucks in uh it's also by the way uh using um uh, protesters who are stopping the trucks instead of bringing the, the police to remove those pre protesters who are right-wing israeli protesters who are again supplying the population uh they are they are saying well we don't have a choice because people are protesting against these supplies so they're speaking from both sides of their mouth. That's not a new thing. The real policy of the Israeli government is, in fact, to put increasing pressure on the population in Gaza through uh, a lack of supplies. This is a concerted policy of starving the population. And the United States, in a sense, is both trying to alleviate the situation and is complicit in it at the same time. Yeah, that, that's one of the harder things to understand, because we've talked about on this show before the, the frustration at why is the U.S. willing to put so much military effort into building this pier and bringing all these resources in, which is one of the most expensive ways to get it done, instead right. of merely putting pressure on Netanyahu to open the gates, to create new holes in the gate, whatever. Then the food comes in today. Not not six, eight weeks from now. So I, I don't really understand that. And, and I wonder if you could speak to uh, some of the reports that are they're that actually claiming that maybe what's behind this and one of the reasons why is, uh, Israel won't open the gates is because they want this floating pier to be built because they have some desire that instead of food coming in on that pier, that maybe one day people could go out on it and go to whether it's Cyprus or, or any other destination in the world to, to basically move the population. Is there any truth to that? I don't know if there's truth to that, but I know that there are pressures within the Israeli government and its supporters, uh, people speaking openly about the desire to remove the population of Gaza from the Strip, uh, whether it would be by a seaport or whether it would be on land or into the Sinai Peninsula, wherever it would be, uh, there are... Uh, significant elements 
uh, among the Israeli right who would like to see Gaza ethnically cleansed. This, this is not something new. There, there, there's been a great talk, um, uh, a great deal of talk about that for months now. Uh, so perhaps they're even thinking about that. I don't, I don't know. Uh, I suspect it would be much more effective uh, to bring the population to a situation of, 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 of total hunger, in, in which case they will try to, be, to break through into Egypt. Um, and the Egyptians have put up, as you know, a, a barrier now in yeah. an attempt to stop that. But it'll be very hard for the Egyptians to, to stop hundreds of thousands of desperate people from trying to get out of a cage in which they have no food. <clears throat> this is very much part of that kind of brutal policy that is being pushed by uh, extremist members of Netanyahu's uh, government um, under his guidance. Uh, and they will continue doing it until they're stopped. And they can only be stopped by being told, if you want to try and do it, you will have to produce your own um, tank shells, your own artillery shells, and you'll have to take care of your business also on the diplomatic international arena instead of, uh, until now, until today, uh, vetoing any attempt to uh, reach a ceasefire. Yeah, and, and you know, and, and part of it, uh, I guess, talking out of both sides of your mouth at the same time, there's one other thing that the uh, ambassador said there, which as a military man, it actually got me more than just eye rolling, kind of angry because I have definite ex personal experience of what he said is not true. When he was saying that actually the Israeli army is the most remarkable force in all of history to take care of the civilian population. Israel is a law abiding democracy. We take every effort to minimize collateral damage. Israel has gone above and beyond to ensure the safety of civilians. We drop warning leaflets, make tens of thousands of phone calls, and provide Gazans with military maps de detailing safe corridors. Israel has taken steps that no other military in any other conflict, any other conflict, has ever taken, all in order to mitigate civilian casualties. So now what do people in Israel think when they hear that and, and anyone who looks at a video that Gary's shown several of them here, and that it's, I mean, anyone can turn on any news and see these where it's very clear that people are starving to death, that the city has been wiped out. The ability to maintain life has been virtually destroyed. Uh, and, and now that a condition exists to where for some indefinite period of time, if the war ended this afternoon, where an entire population of 2 million plus people is going to have to be basically of food coming in from the outside because there is no economy. It doesn't even exist. Uh, what do they make when they hear them say that they're taking such care of the people? Look, I mean, the information that is available to you and to me and to any Israeli citizen who would like to get hold of it is that Israel has used uh, indiscriminate uh, destructive power against Gaza and against civilian population. Um, but most of the Israeli population uh, is watching Israeli TV and listening to Israeli radio. Uh, and there, they don't hear anything about what's happening uh, to the population in Gaza. So what that they hear falls on, on happy ears from them. They think that matches. Absolutely. Absolutely. What they hear is the daily recycling of the horrors of October 7th. Every day there's a report about what happened on October 7th. And so the Israeli public is filled in large part with a rage fear, uh, will for vengeance, and they do not want to know about what's going on. In fact, just the other day, I had an exchange with a friend in Israel who is very liberal and who said in an interview uh, about what's going on in Gaza, he said, I don't have room in my heart for the children of Gaza. I have room in my heart only for our children. Um, and I wrote him, I said, I mean, can, how can you say that? And he simply told me that we disagree. This is in the, liberal, in the liberal sector of the Israeli public. I'm not talking about the settlers and the Ben Gvir and yeah. Smotrich people uh, in the cabinet. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it, you know, it actually breaks my heart to hear that. Because the information, of course, is there. Anybody can turn on Al Jazeera, also in Israel, and watch this happening. Uh, but they refuse to do that. There is no empathy right now in the vast majority of the population in Israel toward uh, the people of Gaza. And this phrase, 
that the IDF is the most moral army in the world comes together with the idea that the IDF now has to be the tool of vengeance against uh, Hamas and against all of Gaza. And somehow people manage to, to put these together uh, and to say, right now, we have to just wipe them out. Uh, and so this has, cannot be changed from within. It can only be changed from without, by pressure from without. So, because right now, I mean, I, I was going to ask this question, but I think based on what you did, it's, it just said that it's pretty self-evident that the, the Israeli population, at least writ large, doesn't have the capacity to disentangle their emotional feelings for what happened on 10-7 and what they deem is, is appropriate retribution. Correct. Watch the damage that's being done to them long term and how Netanyahu's war is actually undermining their security for the future, not replacing it. Absolutely, yes. And there's a kind of celebration of Israeli heroism. So the, the war is shown only through the gun sites of Israeli soldiers. Uh, there's uh, now a celebration, a sort of cult of mourning. Uh, every soldier who is killed, there's uh, uh, long segments on, on, on the news about each individual soldier. And there's nothing about what is happening to the civilian population there. I see. It's, yeah, um, yeah and, 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 and Netanyahu is definitely benefiting from that. I see. Well, that that actually makes some sense. Whether it's right or wrong is a separate issue, but that that makes sense about how that would be uh, how it would play out on the Israeli population. Uh, last question I want to ask you here uh, is on the military itself. So they've been going on at this for five months now, and and as we talk, it doesn't matter what they do or don't do in Rafa. This is not going to end anytime soon because of the the people who are surviving there. I mean, there's there's probably I, I would get or wager well over a quarter of a million men. Of you know that have the capacity to fight there, regardless of whether they had anything to do with Hamas, that are not going to just you know roll over the, the day that Rafa operation is finished. So this is going to continue on. The question is, what about the Israeli military? Because I understand that they've suffered quite a lot of casualties. No one ever talks about that, at least in the Western press. And I wonder if you have any insight into knowledge about what the level of casualties and can they sustain these operations for a long time? So, you know, the Israeli military uh, in on October 7th alone uh, lost about 300 soldiers. Uh, during the military operation since, about, I, I believe, 250 uh, were killed and many, many wounded. And there's also many soldiers with um, obviously PTSD and a lot of other uh, injuries, mental, physical injuries. Uh, th that's, you know, that's high, but it's not uh, tremendously high. The, the main issue is that Israel had to, um, or the IDF had to release most of the reservists. Most of the reservists are back home. Uh, so the army now is fighting with the regular troops. Mm. And the regular army is not very large and is under uh, enormous strain because it's both, it's it stretched out in Gaza, it's stretched out in uh, along the northern border, it's stretched out in the West Bank. And if any major operation were to take place, the reservists would have to be caught up again. Uh, and that has created an enormous amount of economic pressure, mm -hmm. uh, both individual, uh, that, that people just are losing their jobs and have no income, and of course on the economy generally. And so uh, such a long war, you know, since 1948, Israel has not fought such a long war. Even 73 was only 20 days. Uh, and so, uh, yes, this is putting a lot of pressure on the economy. It's putting a lot of pressure on individuals. Uh, the the combat units have seen a great deal of m mental attrition, uh, and I I would say it's sustainable, but it's under a lot of pressure, and it's ultimately weakening uh, Israel's ability to um, sustain its economy. Uh, and I think uh, if there is no political resolution to this, then this is going to continually erode Israel's ability both um, economic and military. And and uh, last question, how long do you think it would take for the Israeli population once this, the, whatever happens in Rafah happens and, and the war doesn't come to an end because it's going to have to continue fighting it even at a so-called lower level, there would have to be some requirement to uh, rule the Gaza, to, break, to keep civil order even if, at that, which will have a, a perpetual cost. At what point does the Israeli people say, 
hey, this is just not worth you know the effort here because the cost is much greater than any benefit. How long might that happen? Three months, another year? What do you think? Uh, look, I mean, it's uh, hard to say where the breaking point is. Uh, right now, some people thought it would happen already, and it hasn't happened. Uh, and I think it's largely because of the effect of October 7th, which is still lingering. You have to understand there are about 150,000 Israelis who have, who, who have been displaced from their homes uh, in the north and in the south. Uh, but I think it will happen. Um, Israel will not be able to control Gaza. Uh, and it's trying now to find all kinds of local elements which are not Hamas to do the work for it. That's not going to work. These, these are mostly gangsters. Uh, you, you can't control a population with a, with a, with a bunch of criminals. It, it, it won't work. So how long will it take? I don't know. If you look at what happened in Lebanon, uh, Israel spent years in Lebanon until it realized finally that it simply could not control it. And, and left, uh, which was the best thing that he could do. But in the process, it created Hezbollah, which is its uh, largest enemy. So I don't know. I think this will have to go together with, the, and only with the political change. I, I know, I'm sure that people in the military, maybe not the top leadership, which will have to go as well. Once the war is over, the entire top uh, leadership of the military uh, will have to resign. I mean, they, you know, they screwed up really big time and they will have to go. And when the political leadership, the current leadership is removed, then there will be a rethinking of all of this. Uh, it will have to happen. And it will mean also rethinking Israel's security policy and Israel's relationship with the Arab states, but especially with the Palestinians. Yeah. And, and of course, all this, this requires the perpetual funding and, and uh, arming by the United States to even allow that to continue going on. And we'll see whether that continues to be the case or whether there's finally eventually some kind of change in Washington. But uh, that, that we'll leave it there for now. And we're going to continue to keep a track of this because this is a dynamic situation that changes a lot, as we've seen just in the last few hours today. Uh, thank you, Professor, for coming on today. We're always very grateful for your insights. Thank you very much. And, and thank you guys for coming. We always appreciate you. We always value you coming to our channel. Uh, we ask you to come back and join us at 3 p.m. We're going to have uh, Ambassador Chaz Freeman on again. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Indo-Pacific policy. Is it deterring China or is it a provocation? You're not going to want to miss this. Ambassador Freeman is one of the best experts in America on issues related to China because he was actually there in the 70s when we did the opening up and he was later chargé d'affaires in Beijing. Nobody better to talk to than that. You're not going to want to miss that. Come back 3 p.m. today and we will see you then on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.